Well, what, what a perfect compliment of a Q&A session to follow a, an excellent uh, synoptic presentation. And that brings us to something that's been mentioned multiple times. And that is, uh, as seen through the lens of eMERGE, uh, this major national initiative, which looks like eMERGE raised to the next uh, level. And uh, no better presenter than uh, Steph Devaney, who is the heart and soul of, uh, of all of us and its uh, predecessor um, label, the Presidential Precision Medicine Initiative. And we're very pleased to have her come and uh, expand our context uh, for um, the importance of the methods of e eMERGE and the opportunities to accelerate this uh, national program. So, Stephanie. Thanks, Dan, and uh, nice to see you. And so many familiar faces. Um, I thought for sure Rex was going to scoop me when he started answering questions about all of us. So um, grateful to still have stuff to talk about. So I have only 15 minutes. I'm going to blow through uh, a large amount of content, but hopefully uh, more of this conversation can happen throughout the day. Uh, we do have, I will, um, I will double down on Rex's comments about the infrastructure that's been built and the lessons that have been learned through Emerge certainly did help set the path for all of us. So uh, we're really grateful. And there's a ton of overlap here in the room in both awardees uh, investigators, uh, folks at NIH that we work with closely, um, members of, of our advisory panel, Marilyn, and even uh, folks who helped us really build the blueprint for this uh, for this large uh, research endeavor that we're, we're launching just now. So uh, just as a reminder, I'm not going to do too much overview of all of us because I think there's some familiarity in the room, but our intention is to uh, build a longitudinal resource with all different types of data on individuals that hopefully last for, hopefully last for many decades. Uh, and we really are interested in making sure that we reach a diversity of people. So our, one of our major focuses is on reaching uh, uh, communities that have been underrepresented in biomedical research and, uh, and maintaining them as participants over the long term. So engagement and retention are really important to us. And then also a diversity of researchers. So building the, re the data set that can be used and utilized by many different types of researchers, not a, not a, a small challenge. So some of the uh, areas I think where there are uh, opportunities for, uh, for convergence between the two programs. And then some places, I think, where we'll learn a lot from Emerge, you'll learn a lot from us, and we can uh, share and swap. I'm going to walk through each of these. So uh, first of all, just sort of the basic, we are building a very large data set. Uh, you guys have a very large data set. We will have EHR data and genomic data and ours in addition to other types. Uh, so this is a real opportunity to expand the data set for uh, understanding uh, many things, uh, just a few of which are, are listed here, uh, pharmacogenomic gen genotypes and drug response, uh, actionable genes and variants, uh, genomic medicine implementation studies, and of course, one something that I care deeply about, uh, LC and policy research. I think there's a real opportunity here to use all of us uh, uh, and take some of the stuff that you guys have already learned and emerge and advance some of these uh, really important uh, ethical, legal, social issues in research. So just a little bit about, while we're talking about data types, just a little bit about uh, all of us. Our, our core baseline of data that we're uh, pulling together right now on the participants that have already joined uh, and over the near term is uh, asking everyone to go through a number of surveys. We have three surveys at the outset and we'll be uh, deploying four more as um, over time so that participants are slowly answering more uh, surveys digitally. We will be asking everyone to share access to their electronic health records. Uh, they'll be undergoing physical evaluation and we're collecting blood and urine samples to run genomics but as well as other assays. Uh, ultimately, we plan to incorporate mobile and wearable technologies and uh, environmental data in addition to a number of other type data types. We like to show this visual at the bottom uh, to, to, uh, to uh, make the point clear that right now we're building version one of the platform, but we really do intend to add data types over time as technologies evolve and as we understand what the scientific community needs or what, uh, what types of research questions could be answered on a program and, and a, a sample set of this size and scale over time. Uh, so uh, individuals can enroll either through a healthcare provider organization or as direct volunteers from uh, any internet source. Uh, here is a, a map of our um, healthcare provider organizations. A lot of overlap with Emerge, as you can see. Uh, happy to uh, ask, answer any questions about this uh, at any point. And of course, right now, what we're thinking about is our genome is the uh, how we're going to um, uh, build start to start to build out our genomic data set. Uh, we have a, um, an expert panel that has just finished their work, and we'll be hearing uh, their, their report over the next couple of days. Uh, Eric Green was very helpful in that process, helping us to figure out what are the different options we could uh, undertake as we think about 
ultimately doing whole genome sequencing on a million people, uh, but where do we start? Uh, so just a, a, a quick thing on our data access, because this came up uh, when Rex was talking and, and moving to a cloud-based platform. So all of us research program is going to be, our data set will be in the cloud uh, from the start. Uh, we have, we are developing, we just, just finalized our uh, data access policy, our framework for how uh, researchers will access the data. Uh, we, uh, it's a researcher-based access, uh, no data removal, uh, tiered access approval. We're uh, developing a data passport model, which I'll talk about, and we really are interested in broad access. So how can we make this platform usable by many different types of researchers? Uh, so essentially what happens is uh, we will have all of the data in one place in a curated data repository. Uh, researchers will ask for access from a, uh, a board that, or a committee that we have in, internally to the consortium. And then once they get uh, access as a researcher, they can then launch a bunch of different studies. So we're not going to be doing study-specific um, review. So a researcher can come in and launch three different workspaces or however many workspaces they want. They'll have to get really clear about what they're trying to do with that data so that we can post it publicly. We have to do that according to the Cures Act, but also uh, one of the things that we're really relying on to make sure that researchers abide by the code of conduct is transparency. And so the extent to which the public can see what researchers are doing with the data, uh, we think is, is really important. Um, uh, here's just a, a real quick uh, visual of our data tiers. We will have a public data set that will be aggregated data that will be open to anyone, anywhere, anytime, no login required. This is a little bit like how the census does it. Uh, then we'll have registered data set, which is, oops, sorry about that, uh, which is uh, high, a little bit higher risk of identifying uh, participants and will require a data use agreement, identity verification, ethics training, and approval. Again, researcher-based, not study-based or question-based. And then controlled data is, uh, is going to include genomic data and some other uh, higher risk data types. Uh, again, uh, researcher-based. So once you have access, you can sort of launch as many studies as you'd like to. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is uh, Innovative methods for integration of different types of health data for research. So as we move forward, uh, we're learning a tremendous amount from what you guys have already done with electronic health records. Uh, we also, though, need to collect EHR data on participants who come into the program from their smartphone or from their public library, from a website. Uh, and we don't necessarily know who their provider is, and we don't have a direct relationship with their provider. And so we're going to have to get on the EHR front, as well as other different other data types, we're going to have to get pretty creative and build technologies in order to incorporate those data types. Uh, I think that this could ultimately be a, a, a place of interest between the two programs. But we have, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Sync for Science, um, uh, as well as uh, data aggregators and different uh, things that we're piloting to try and get EHR data in on our direct volunteer participants. Uh, but also we're interested in claims data. We have just been funded by the PCOR Trust Fund uh, and a collaboration between NIH and CMS to uh, deploy Sync for Science-like technology on, for claims data so that uh, people uh, who have Medicare, Medicare beneficiary claims data can uh, agree to donate that data to the All of Us Research Program or really any research program uh, that, that will be uh, available for the research community broadly. Um, we're looking into getting data from uh, pharmacy managers uh, directly so that we can get a sense of what prescriptions are filled on participants. Uh, genetic testing reports, we, the uh, Office of the National Coordinator has started a project called Sync for Genes, which will begin to help uh, with uh, genomic testing uh, information. And, and there's, there's many other different types that could be added to this list. We're starting to think about all different sources of data that we would like to bring in to the program. I think one of the big questions for us uh, will be, how are these data coming in? Are we, are we relying on our primary consent and then, and then pulling the data from the back end from these organizations? Or are we going to be entering more of a participant-mediated situation where the patient says, I want to share my data from ShareScripts or I want to share my data from Medicare? And uh, that's a really important. We, we really like that model because it creates, a, it creates the situation where the participant gets to control their data and I think really puts pressure on some of these organizations to free up data that is, uh, that is the right of the person to access and share for research. So uh, just real quick on Sync for Science, uh, and I'll uh, take a moment here to give Dan Macy's a shout out for, uh, for I think, coining this term, perhaps. Uh, and, uh, and this was really important. We, we got really excited about this project because uh, it, this is truly participant-mediated EHR sharing. And so sort of both relies on a HIPAA right of access and also technology to get the right data and the right form and format into our system. Uh, so the way that Sync for Science works is that 
Um, our, any of our participants who join directly, not through a healthcare provider organization that we're funding, but directly from their couch, uh, can uh, go into their, per, their patient portal and say, yes, I want to donate my, go through all of the agreements and then say, yes, I want to donate my data to the All of Us Research Program. And that data will then come into the Data and Research Center in the form and format that we would want it to come in. Um, and so that it can be uh, added to our data set. Uh, we are partnering with four uh, major vendors to, accomplish, to build the technology. Uh, Epic, Eclinical Works, Cerner, and Allscripts have all contributed greatly to this, and they will be deploying the technology at 14 pilot provider sites starting in the next month or two. Uh, so we'll get a real test of how well this is working with the patient controlling the data flow. Uh, the, another challenge we have uh, that I'm, I'm sure Emerge has had too, I'd love to hear more about this throughout the day and other large cohorts, is engagement and retention. Uh, so we are, um, because we're trying to reach so many people, we're really thinking about uh, both getting folks in the door, but then how do we retain them? And this might be, it's a different scenario when we have uh, folks coming in through a uh, relationship with a provider, and there's a real strong relationship between that provider and their patient base. And it's very different when we have digital, uh, digital participants, and we understand that fall off could be quite dramatic. So uh, trying to think about, you know, how to engage people digitally. I listed some uh, some things here that we're doing, we are we're really uh, interested in participant feedback. We have a lot of surveys, usability testing that we're deploying all the time, and we're trying to get in the frame of mind where we can get participant feedback and make changes to the program pretty rapidly. Um, but uh, we also are working with federally qualified health centers. We're going to learn about how, lot, a lot about how to work with their populations. We have uh, new community engagement partners that are helping us to be sort of trusted intermediaries between a certain population in our program and hoping to build engagement and trust that way. Um, but one of the things I wanted to talk about here with this group, because I, I, I think it might be of interest, is uh, also deploying some digital engagement tools. So different ways that we can use our digital platform to keep people interested in the program and sharing data with us as well. Some of the things that we've been thinking about and uh, our team here at Vibrant, I think PJ's here somewhere in the room, uh, has been helping us along with the Scripps team to think a lot about what different types of uh, things we could deploy through our app that would both give the data, the, the scientific community data, and also keep people engaged in the program and give them something back for participating. Uh, so here's just a couple examples. We'll continue to refine this over time. Interested in uh, any thoughts from folks in the room here? Uh, and, then, and then finally, speaking of returning things back and giving back to our program, we have made a promise from the beginning of the, uh, of the build of the Precision Medicine Initiative, which is now uh, um, uh, still a thriving uh, initiative, but this one piece of it, which is now called All of Us, about returning information and, and promising to our participants that we will both return information and even specific results, raw data, to participants. Uh, so this is a big task, as you all know. You've been doing this for a decade. Um, we, uh, we imagine there will be areas where this will be pretty simple uh, and really just requires building out the technologies. You can see over here on the right, uh, the, uh, we will be ultimately giving people their survey data back and showing how they compare within the broader demographic and just a nice interface. Um, we'll be giving uh, individual access to their EHR data so they can see what actually we have on them, what came from their EHR and what data we have, uh, claims data, any other data that comes in uh, that they share with us, uh, individual research results, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, of course, ongoing study updates, aggregated results, scientific findings, all of the things that come out of the study we'll want to share back with our participants. Um, and then opportunities for them to be contacted for other research opportunities, especially as we learn more over them on them over time and, and it becomes clear what, what, uh, what other studies they might be um, interested in. Uh, so genetic results, we had a workshop in March, which uh, many of you- Steph, I think you're losing your mic. Am I? Can you maybe just- Oh, it's probably too far down. Have people been able to hear me? Okay. Yeah, it was just the, it was just the last okay. minute or two. Thanks, Sharon. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Helpful. Um, uh, but uh, so I thought I had another slide on this. So return of results. You know, for us, we have. Um, here, actually, back to my slide. So we have uh, just begun thinking about how we're going to return results to participants. Uh, uh, for us, we, you know, this is going to be quite the challenge. And you guys have done a lot of work here. I think we at this March and at this workshop in March, we agreed that we should start with the ACMG 59 pharmacogenomics, it sounds like Emerge has done a lot of work here, and we certainly will benefit from the clinical decision support and some of the patient resources that you have already developed. 
uh, we would love to you know, start this journey with you and learn and share uh, and share uh, lessons learned across both of the consortia because I think this will be one of our uh, greatest challenges and could be quite resource heavy. Uh, and then finally, electronic phenotyping and uh, Rex talked a ton about this. I mean, we have you know, we have none of this. We really are going to uh, be able to take advantage of the the well validated and uh, public phenotypes that Emerge has developed. Uh, right off the get-go, and that's a huge running start for us and for the researchers who access the data. Um, and then uh, integration of genomic findings into EHRs for clinical research and care. We are not anywhere near this point, uh, but really look forward to learning from uh, you all on how to sort of complete the cycle from research back into clinical care. And then finally, this is my last point. I just wanted to um, expand upon my point earlier about how we intend to add data types over time. We are uh, really interested. We set up the core data set based on the ACD working group report that helped with sort of the blueprint for our study and also what we think people might want to have on hand. But we want to work with the scientific community to understand across all of the different domains, what are the types of data that would have the most impact on a data set of this size and scale uh, that would be common across many different re uh, uh, research questions so that we can uh, maximize uh, the impact of the different data types we add to this large participant base over time. Uh, and so we'll be holding a workshop in March uh, to start to talk through some of those use cases and understand uh, what's most beneficial and, and hope to include researchers and participants in that as well. This just shows uh, how we're breaking up the workshop to talk about all of the different, um, all of the different uh, 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 scientific topics that we think this uh, program is right to help understand. Um, and so then uh, just briefly where we are, we've enrolled. I'm sure this number has gone up. Josh could probably give us the latest numbers as of today. Um, but at, at, at least 4,600 participants have gone through the full protocol at about 60 sites. We're going to continue to ramp up between now and winter. We're in beta phase. You can only join with a code, so it's invite only at this point. Um, we're going to be uh, ramping up to over 100 uh, sites that will be enrolling participants and hopefully around 10 to 15,000 participants, that's a guess, uh, so that we can launch this spring and open up the doors fully. That's it. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, questions? Do you have any restrictions on the uh, data access to the module? Microphone. Oh, you, so good question. He, his question was, will, will we have any restrictions on data access when we open the doors? Um, so we, we, the data resource actually will not be available to researchers when we open the doors. It's really just for, just for participants to join. Um, we expect to have the researcher portal open sometime later in the year. So the same question. Well, we have data. Okay, fair enough. Uh, <laughs> you want the substance. Uh, so we, uh, when we do open the doors, I, I imagine we'll want to do some sort of beta testing phase. But once we have opened the doors to researchers broadly, the access process will be the same for pretty much anyone. We'll ask them to go through a code of conduct to identify, you know, uh, validate who they are, um, and then um, and then go through approval. And uh, that should really be the same process for everyone. We are running into a little trouble because we're hoping to, inter to integrate citizen scientists. And that's trickier because at the controlled data level where we have some more of the high risk data types, we want to have an institutional backing. Uh, and it's, it's hard to, uh, that's, that's a challenge we're working on. Is there a way that we can get institutions or organizations to validate citizen scientists so that they can get access to some of the you know, deeper data? Uh, but we haven't figured that piece out yet. Uh, but so not no no real no major restrictions, unless Josh. Do I, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, um, I didn't know if I'm okay. Yeah. Well, I think she's first. Oh. Well, thank you. Um, two questions. One was I heard you in talking about the access is going to be researcher based as opposed to project based but also emphasize the transparency of the description. So I like the researcher-based because it can be a pain in the butt to go back and sort of do everything. But at the same time, there's the transparency. So how are you going to combine those things that if a reacher comes up with another project that they have to make sure to report it, or how does that work? Yeah. And then a separate question is, the sync for science is awesome, and if, if it works. Yeah. <laughs> um, and in theory, if people can sync to your model, then someone with Cerner data could sync out for your model and then sync back to Epic. And is anyone looking at that as sort of a solution to interoperability? Hmm. I don't know if you. Um, yeah, I'm probably not the right person to answer that question, although I think I, I, I love how you're thinking. Um, but on the first question, um, which was data uh, uh, transparency and access. 
So we, uh, yeah, so it's all uh, researcher based. When a researcher starts to opens up a new workstation, which is where sort of where they'll pull the data that they want to use to answer a specific question, we'll ask them to get pretty clear about what they're trying to do. Um, and we both, we need to post that publicly uh, and we want to. And then we're relying on the panopticum, which is a new word I've used and love using now, I just learned this, um, to, uh, to help look across these different data uses and uh, flag stuff if they think some researcher is acting outside of the code of conduct. So because we're not doing a study-by-study study review, we're really losing that opportunity to look at some of the research questions and we don't want, uh, we want to be sure that there's, uh, there aren't a whole bunch of studies going on that either violate our code of conduct or which will also be public or uh, you know, get into some sort of stigmatizing uh, area that could cause problems for some of our communities that we're hoping to build trust with. So uh, at that point, if somebody flags something, we will have our uh, board uh, be able to review those studies. So which is why we're leaning so deeply on transparency. Sure. Oh, sorry. Um, no. Two sure. quick things. I think it's. Oh wait. Right. Did you want to respond to that? That was okay. Oh, right. Okay. The, um, uh, each workspace can be attached to a bunch of people, and so the descriptions in a workspace, a computational, you know, place where data and analysis will happen, um, uh, you know, can have many people attached to it, and that has labels. So anyone that works on a common project will be in that same place with the same descriptions of what the project is, um, and that's sort of the mediation. And any group of projects. Uh, any individual can be on a whole bunch of different projects with a whole bunch of different clusters of people. So it's all driven by the workspace connection, if that's clear. And yes, we are thinking about um, uh, inter EHR and intra site and all that kind of stuff, collaboration with Sync for Science. Um, it's, it's based on Smart on Fire and sort of the growing fire descriptions. And so, so you know, you could imagine that. And it was always envisioned, as I'm sure Dan would, would say as well, as, you know, a, a 300 you know, 50 million plus, you know, experiment, not just a 1 million, you know, or 10 million or whatever, you know, all of us ends up being. In the, is there anyone else? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, you're okay. up. Okay. So, um, you know, another thought, the, you know, the, the literature would suggest the um, decision support directed to the patient can be very effective, hmm. actually effective in activating the patient to subsequently activate their, their doctor. So I wonder if the Sync for Science resource might allow a patient, citizen patient, uh, if you will, to suggest their data set or their assets be linked up to decision support services from both public and private sources. Blackford, that wouldn't have anything to do with the PCORI uh, uh, patient-facing CDS the thing that you lead, would it? An interesting idea. Thank you for that. We, we haven't thought that far, but I appreciate that. My question is sort of a follow-on to that. Uh, in, in the return of results uh, activities, I didn't hear anything about returning the results to physicians. How, how are physicians out of this loop? Or I, we hope that they're not. And uh, you know, these are some policies that we're going to be developing with the uh, healthcare organizations that we're so closely linked to that are the help building this program with us. Um, but we haven't fully defined that whole process. So this is something that we're working on. You know, we certainly uh, want to have all of that defined by the time we start running genomics. Uh, at least, because that's really going to be the first individual level results that will be returned to people. So I, I think I'm out of time. Dan's going to maybe grab me at a break. I'm at zero minutes. Yeah, so if you could ask your questions, if, if Stephanie's going to be around for a little while, you could ask the questions directly.